Today's video is brought to you by our longtime friends over at Squarespace, who are going to help you finally cash in on that creative idea you've been thinking about developing. I don't know about you, but when I go on holiday, I can't help but think about work. <sighs> At least just a little bit or you know creative projects that I want to work on but regardless of whether you're in another country or just walking in the park on the other side of town you might start to think about finally launching that one project you've been daydreaming about fortunately Squarespace gives you every possible tool you might want to fashion your next project whether it's a small business a sports blog a creative portfolio or just a page full of dank memes it doesn't matter if you can dream it you can build it with Squarespace are you looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like BAM use one of their quick beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you or maybe you're more of a hands-on person. You've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly a site should look like. Well, Squarespace gives you all of the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical nonsense to sweat about. And once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design, if you want, there are tons of extra features so your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24 7 customer support. Really everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small if it involves your website you got to do it with squarespace right now go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch your new site go to squarespace.com slash brain food and you'll save 10 percent of your first purchase of a website or a domain and now today's video It's a classic parenting nightmare. You drop off your tiny taunt at the grandparents' or a friend's birthday party, hoping to get a few hours reprieve from tending to their every shrill and snot-nosed demands, but alas, your plan backfires. When you return to pick them up, you discover that their hosts have filled them up with enough sugary treats to put an elephant into a diabetic coma. Coursing through their tiny veins, the sweet, sticky stuff gives them the manic energy of a hundred Gary Buseys, causing them to scream and shout and bounce off the walls like a cocaine fueled howler monkey. And you start seriously questioning your decision to bring new life into this world. Feel familiar? At this point, you parents in the audience are probably furiously nodding your heads, having experienced this exact scenario many, many times. Only no, you haven't. Not really. For while the dreaded sugar rush might be a staple of parenting lore and humor, this phenomena is, in fact, nothing more than a persistent medical myth. Believe it or not, eating excessive amounts of sugar does not cause people to become hyperactive, not even children. In fact, it has exactly the opposite effect. But Simon! I hear you cry. Of course sugar makes children hyperactive. I've seen it with my own bloody eyes. All right, all right. Put down your torches, put down your pitchforks, and your phone set to speed dial the neighborhood watch. And join us as we delve into the science of sugar, energy, mood, and what's actually going on here. At first glance, the idea of the sugar rush makes perfect sense. After all, our bodies need sugar to produce energy. It follows then that more sugar should produce more energy. But decades of scientific research have thoroughly debunked this seemingly straightforward assumption. In 2019, a meta-study conducted at Berlin's Humboldt University, Lancaster University, and the University of Warwick, researchers analyzed the data from 31 trials examining the short-term psychological effects of consuming large amounts of carbohydrates in including sugar on healthy adults. The analysis examined various psychological parameters, including alertness, alertness, the right to put it in twice there, he obviously was having too many carbohydrates, depression, calmness, fatigue, confusion, tension, and anger at intervals of 0 to 30, 31 to 60, and 60 plus minutes following carbohydrate ingestion. Contrary to popular expectation, the researchers found no significant change in the subject's mood due to high sugar consumption. They also found that high sugar consumption did not impart greater energy. Quote, in fact, sugar consumption was related to decreased alertness and higher levels of fatigue within the first hour of post ingestion. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, but from a biological standpoint, it makes perfect sense. While sugar can indeed give you an energy boost, this only works if you're already suffering from hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. If your blood sugar is normal, consuming more sugar or other carbohydrates will not give you more energy. Instead, your body stores the excess energy by converting it into fat, a process which in turn consumes a large amount of energy, leading to the increased fatigue associated with eating a heavy meal. The so-called food coma. But Simon, I can hear you protesting. The 2009 study was conducted on adults. Surely sugar affects children differently. Well, no. 
It doesn't. In 1994, a study conducted by Dr. Mark Walrake and his colleagues from the University of Oklahoma examined 50 children whose parents claimed they were especially sensitive to sugar. Each subject was assigned a diet high in either sugar, aspartame, or saccharin. The parents were unaware of what their child was consuming. Yet, despite two-thirds of the children being given sweeteners with absolutely no caloric value, their parents still reported hyperactive behavior after eating sweets. Whatever was causing the children's bad behavior it was not the sugar so well what was to blame then another study published in 1994 hints at a probable cause in this study daniel w hoover and richard millick of the university of kentucky videotaped interactions between 35 mothers and their five-year-old children half of the mothers were told that their children had consumed large amounts of sugar while the others were told they had consumed no sugar at all in fact all the children had received a sugar-free placebo nonetheless the videotapes revealed that the mothers who believed their children had consumed sugar consistently rated their behavior as more hyperactive. They were also more protective and critical of their children, reprimanding them more often. This suggests that sugar rushes are, in fact, something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because parents believe sugar causes hyperactivity, they parent their children poorly, triggering the very hyperactive behavior they are trying to avoid. Researchers have also put forward other potential factors. For example, perhaps hyperactivity causes children to eat more sugar and not the other way around. Also, many environments associated with high energy play, such as birthday parties, are also associated with high sugar consumption. So, what we have here is yet another example of that classic scientific sin, inferring causation from correlation. But where did the notion of the sugar rush originally come from? Most sources trace the myth back to 1973, when allergist Dr. Benjamin Feingold published his eponymous Feingold Diet. Feingold advocated a diet free of salicylates, food coloring, and artificial flavorings, arguing that these additives had severe psychological effects and that eliminating them could help treat various childhood behavioral issues, including hyperactivity. While Feingold didn't call for the elimination of sugar specifically, parents soon came to distrust all food additives, especially processed sugar, which was becoming increasingly prevalent in all kinds of food products. The notion that sugar causes behavioral problems got a boost in 1978 with the publication of a study in the journal Food and Cosmetics Toxicology, which examined 265 children described by their parents as hyperactive and unable to concentrate. The study found that many of these children suffered from abnormally low blood sugar levels, which, as we have already covered, is paradoxically associated with high sugar consumption. And with that, the myth of the sugar rush was born. But it did not take long for this to be debunked. Subsequent studies have shown that, in fact, the 265 subjects of the 1978 study blood sugar levels well within the normal range for children their age. As early as 1982, the National Institutes of Health debunked the sugar rush myth, while in 1995, a meta-study by Dr. Mark Warrick, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, examined the findings of 16 studies on sugar and behavior and came to the same overwhelming conclusion. Sugar does not cause hyperactivity. In fact, so definitive were the results that a statistician who reviewed the study told Warreich and his colleague that he had never seen such consistently negative results in a statistical analysis. So, in conclusion, everything you think you know about sugar and behavior is dead wrong, as Dr. Warreich neatly summed up in his 2019 paper to quote, Interestingly, despite researchers not having reached a consensus regarding the exact effects of sugar on mood, it seems that the public strongly believes in the idea idea that sugar improves mood and increases activity levels, especially in children. Our findings indicate that sugary drinks or snacks do not provide a quick fuel refill to make us feel more alert. Thus, while there are many reasons to be wary of your children consuming too much of the sweet stuff, including childhood obesity, type 2 diabetes, and other metabolic disorders, hyperactivity is not among them. So if your child is bouncing off the walls, you'll have want to consider what other factors might be at play besides excess of sweets and soda. Maybe their environment is too stimulating or not stimulating enough. Maybe they are acting out against unfair parenting. Or, at the end of the day, maybe they are just children simply doing what children do. And now for a bonus fact. Ever wonder why sugar doesn't ever seem to spoil? Well, want to know more? Two foods are left out on the counter, fresh tomatoes and a bowl of sugar. Within a week or so, one will develop black spots and the other remains pristine, albeit perhaps a little clumpy depending on the humidity of the air. The reason? 
Osmosis. While microorganisms love sugar, they also need a certain amount of water to thrive. This level of freely available water, called water activity, or AW for bacteria, is about 0.91. For molds, it's 0.8. And for fungi, yeasts, it must be at least 0.6. The AW of fresh foods is generally about 0.99, while crystalline sucrose table sugar is a paltry 0.06. In its crystal form, sucrose loves to bind with water. Water. When present in sufficient concentrations, table sugar will suck up all of the water around it. This is why sugar is an excellent food preservative. Via osmosis, the sugar pulls the available water from within the food stuff, reducing the food's AW, thus making it unsuitable for microbes to grow in or even to survive. More specifically, at the outer edge of a cell is its membrane, a semi-permeable barrier that allows some substances, including nutrients and wastes, to move in and out. With a higher concentration of sugar outside the cell, the solution is hypertonic, meaning it will draw water from the cell, causing the bacteria or whatever cell to shrivel and die. The reverse could potentially happen as well if the sugar concentration was high enough inside the cell, hypertonic, with it drawing water in, perhaps to the point of bursting the cell. On a chemical level, it's pretty interesting as well. There's a lot of hydrogen and oxygen involved between these two molecules. Indeed, there are 24 hydrogen atoms and 12 oxygen. Each oxygen atom has a slight negative charge, and each hydrogen hydrogen atom has a slight positive charge, and in chemistry, opposites attract. Together, all of these hydrogen and oxygen atoms pull at each other, initially to form their respective molecules, table sugar or water, and then in the process, that kills the microbe. You can observe this absorption effect simply by taking some cotton candy, which is made of pure spun sugar, and placing it in a humid environment. With just 33% relative humidity, cotton candy left out in the air will completely collapse and crystallize in just three days as it absorbs the moisture in the air. At 45% relative humidity, it will completely collapse in just one day. At 75% humidity, it takes just an hour. This is why it has only been since 1972 that non-made-on-demand cotton candy has been available. 1972 was when the first fully automated cotton candy machine was invented that could make the fluffy treat and quickly package it in watertight containers. As speaking of cotton candy, while it may seem like cotton candy, which again is made of pure sugar, sometimes with food coloring or other flavoring added, would be pretty much the worst thing in the world for you to eat, it should be noted that it only takes about 30 grams of sugar to make a typical serving size of cotton candy, which is about 9 grams less than a 12-ounce can of Coke. Further, cotton candy has no fat, no preservatives, and is only about 115 calories per serving. While certainly not a health food nor filling in any way, there are numerous things people consume every day that are much worse for them health-wise.